So why do we need to put a price on human life? Putting prices on human life is really somewhat ubiquitous. And what you'll see is that it happens in many aspects of society. In our civil court system, it happens routinely. We have it in our regulatory system to balance the costs and benefits impacted by society on different regulations. It, it happens for for-profit companies all the time because no for-profit company could stay in business if they simply invested in every safety device imaginable. So decisions have to be made, and there's trade-offs that happen. Uh, what are the different approaches you can take to, put, uh, to actually put the, you know, a number on a life? So the value of a statistical life, this is an economically derived number. There's different ways that could be derived, but if we talk about today, today regulators put a price tag of about $10 million per life. That's the fixed number. That number is used for regulators when they try to balance what is the cost of increased regulations versus the benefits in terms of life savings. And they use the same value for everyone. Rich or poor, young or old, no matter where you live, the same value. That's sort of an equality principle. All lives are valued equally. You can contrast that with income-based assessment. And civil court is very much driven by looking at loss of income. They may have other factors they take into account, but when they look at a negligent death, that's one of the primary factors they look at. Well, the problem with income is income is subject to so many factors. There are gender biases. There are racial biases. There are age biases, location biases, all that it would influence your income. You also have the reality that some people may choose a profession that simply doesn't hurt as much, or maybe they're dedicating more time to caregiving. So income-based calculations are performed very much in the civil court system, and that often drives a lot of the calculations that companies use when they do their cost-benefit analysis. Let's now talk about the value of statistical life. So how do economists arrive at the value of statistical life? So economists develop estimates of the value of statistical life using different methods. Uh, one of them looks at hazard pay. How much more do I have to pay an employee to take on more risk? The idea being that um, if you're putting your life at risk, you should get paid a substantial amount more. And that ratio gives an estimate. Now, that in itself is problematic. Why? Because employees, one, they may not have a choice. They might have to take the job. Two, they may not have negotiating ability. Three, they may not know the incremental risk. So there's tons of theoretical issues with that calculation. Uh, but it's done. It has a huge range to it in terms of the computed estimate, and it varies by so many factors. That's one method. It's problematic. There's another method, which is a survey-based method. And they just ask people, how much more do I have to pay you to take an additional 1 in 10,000 risk of dying of this in the next year, for example? Well, ask an abstract theoretical question to a non-random sample because who's going to stop and answer the survey? I'm not stopping. Are you stopping? No. You're going to find a non-random sample of people who are willing to do the survey. And then if they, if they give you an answer like your question is unanswerable, you drop them. If they say infinity, you drop them. So all of the answers that aren't convenient for your analysis, you then get rid of them. So in the end, you have a very, very small set of responses from a non-random sample that conform to the investigator's predisposition, and that becomes the analysis. That's another method. And if it sounds very flawed, it's because it is. Um, huge variations across countries, across subpopulations, individuals, some take on more risks, don't, gen there's so many biases with it. But to me, the flaws are secondary. It serves a very positive point. The positive point is that by having a high value, and currently all regulators use a number of around $10 million, it serves to protect lives. Got it. Okay. And uh, which, which one is better? I think that the regulatory approach is more fair. It's not perfect, uh, but I think it's more fair than the income-based method. Uh, it 
it doesn't allow for a lower bound. It doesn't allow for a situation where someone has so little value placed on their life that they're exposed to risk. And, and I'll tell you an example that fleshes it out. So Cheryl Thurston was an inpatient at a New York care facility. She was supposed to be watched at all times when bathing. The care facility was negligent. They failed to watch her. Well, she ended up slipping into a coma. Within 24 hours, she died. Her sister sued the care facility. The judge determined that the care facility was negligent, but the judgment was for zero dollars, nothing. And why was it nothing? Because the judge said that New York put no intrinsic value on human life. Cheryl was not earning money. She was, in fact, earning money. And she never suffered pain. She never woke up from her coma. And then the judge said that had Cheryl been chattel, like a cow or a chicken, then her sister would have been entitled to come. And that, to me, is not only just completely unjust and inhuman, but it sends a message. It sends a message to every care facility in New York that if you cause the negligent death of someone, you may not have to pay anything. Fast forward, it's 2020. Thousands and thousands of people in New York have died in nursing homes of COVID. It's a fact. New York has lawsuit protection. They cannot get sued. So lives that are more valued and more protected, lives that are less valued are less. So on that note, uh, let's talk about you know how the EPA uses the statistical value of life and what exactly is a cost-benefit analysis. Sure. So when we talk about regulatory agencies and how they use the value of a statistical life, they, they have a basic process they undergo. It's a systematic analysis. And they're required to look at costs and benefits um, through executive order mandates. Now, in this particular case, what they do is they identify a series of options. If it's the EPA, let's say they're examining different levels of arsenic in the water. And they will look to see what are the costs associated with reducing the arsenic level. And what are the benefits? The health benefits in terms of reduced morbidity and mortality, so disease and death. And they monetize that. They look at when these morbidities and mortalities would be prevented. And then what's the dollar figure associated? What's the value of that life being saved? And, and so how do, how do all of these things come together in a cost-benefit analysis? And, and how can they, uh, you know, these be gamed? Well, they all come together in terms of coming out with an assessment of whether uh, a set of proposals is beneficial to the benefits exceed the cost. And you know, there's different players involved, right? So there's a standard discount rate that's used, 3%. People use sensitivities around these discount rates. Um, that's pretty commonly done. Uh, what you'll find is that Industry uh, players will often try to overemphasize what are the costs of meeting regulatory standards. And of course, you know, you'll have activists on the other side who will keep pushing the other direction. Right? And this is the public dialogue. Now, of course, you're citing scientific studies, but science itself has a lot of opportunity for people to interpret in different ways. And I think we, as we see more and more science, we understand that. Uh, things don't work the same in a clinical trial as in the real world. So once that's all said, uh, you then have the classic case of the Ford Pinto memo. And this was a situation where Ford, a car company, was trying to encourage regulators to not increase the safety standards of cars. They knew they had an issue with their Ford Pinto. They did a cost-benefit calculation. In that cost-benefit calculation, they estimated costs of improving the safety of their car and the benefits in terms of lives saved due to accidents, and they monetized the lives. And they monetized the lives, this is back in the 1970s, at about $200,000 per life saved. Well, Mother Jones wrote a scathing article about uh, this work. The public was livid. They could not believe that this was happening, that companies are balancing their profits versus human lives. Well, it happens all the time. It just happened to be front page news as people saw that. Now, as it turned out, Ford had overestimated the cost of the repairs, and they massively underestimated what it was going to cost them 
in lawsuits later because they lost uh, some pretty substantial lawsuits about the preventable death. So net result here was that it wasn't a theoretical exercise. It had a real world implications. Regulators were involved because this was trying to inform the regulatory decision. I think an important message that I'd like people to retain is that price tags are put on our lives all the time in many different aspects of society, for-profit companies, the court systems, regulatory agencies do it, healthcare companies, life insurance. And in many of these different aspects, we have to be aware that sometimes these price tags are unfair. When they're unfair, we should act. We should challenge them. Why? Because lives that are less valued are less protected, lives that are more valued are more protected. And when we're seeing our lives being less valued, we need to challenge that.